and they took their inspiration from the straight lines and smooth surfaces of the new machine age. The most enigmatic of these dreamers was a Dutch painter called Piet Mondrian. Piet Mondrian was quiet, meticulous. If you met him, you could even say boring. But he saw himself as a man with a mission. What he wanted to do was drag Paris, Europe, the entire world into a brave new age. And he thought the best way to do that was through painting. After the First World War, Mondrian came to settle in Paris, where he lived and worked in a squalid building in Montparnasse. But inside, his studio seemed to belong to a different world. This is an exact replica of Mondrian's studio in Paris, and just how it would have looked in 1928. What a space. Now, in the late 1920s, this was pretty much the most famous studio in all of Europe. It was a legendary place, and it was Mondrian's pride and joy. He planned every single square inch of this studio. The colour patches, the yellows and blacks and greys and reds, even the little mirrors were meticulously placed on the walls. The furniture was carefully chosen, and Mondrian even painted his paint box and his matchbox so they didn't disrupt from the overall colour scheme. Now Mondrian was clearly an obsessive compulsive when it came to his studio, but that was for a reason. Because this, for Mondrian, wasn't just a place to live and work. This was his prototype for the utopia he was trying to bring to the entire world. By 1928, Mondrian had developed and mastered his great signature style. And one of his finest works from the period is this one. Now this little picture is quintessential Mondrian, a square painting by an equally square man. Now it looks pretty simple, but actually Mondrian spent months on it, varying the thickness of the lines by fractions of millimetres and experimenting with the different colours in different positions until eventually he arrived at this. And what he arrived at is, to my mind, perfect. And it was meant to be perfect because for Mondrian this painting was the portrait of a pure, timeless, universal reality, a reality that underpinned everything we see. And in order to reach that reality, in order to capture that reality, what Mondrian has done is distilled everything in the world, all its messiness, all its variety, to the most basic forms. And the most basic forms for Mondrian are the vertical line, the horizontal line, black, white, and the three primary colors. Now, why did he choose those? Well, for him, those forms were the ingredients of absolutely everything. With the colours on that canvas, you can make every colour. And with the forms on that canvas, you can make every form. The horizons, the trees, the buildings, the streets, masses, voids, even people. So for Mondrian, this painting was, I suppose, the cosmos in shorthand, the visual DNA of the entire universe. But as Mondrian was painting an ideal world, others were out building it. In the 1920s around all of Europe, a new kind of architecture was emerging, an architecture that shared the same utopian modernist spirit. And if this powerful movement had any one ringleader, it was a young Swiss architect who called himself Le Corbusier. In 
1924, Le Corbusier founded a small architectural practice in Paris with his cousin, and it was here that he began to devise a new kind of home, one that he was very happy to live in himself. Now this is Le Corbusier's own apartment. He lived and worked here for most of his life in Paris, and it really showcases his idea of the modern home. For it couldn't be more different to the traditional high-ceilinged, parquet-floored Parisian apartments. Le Corbusier thought homes should be machines for living in, and this one is a showcase for his new design principles. It's full of natural light. One whole wall is almost entirely made of glass. It's open plan. In fact, some of its most private rooms don't have doors at all. And every single feature is eminently functional. He even built this bed just high enough so he could look out at Paris when he was lying down. For Le Corbusier, this apartment was peaceful, practical, healthy, hygienic and beautiful. And he wanted to make sure that others could live this life too. But Le Corbusier was not content with changing one building at a time. He wanted to transform whole cities, and Paris was first on his list. He examined the city from every angle. He watched its inhabitants eating, drinking and cavorting. But where others had fallen in love with its beautiful buildings, elegant boulevards and quaint little squares, Le Corbusier saw a city on the verge of extinction. The city is crumbling and it cannot last much longer. It is unhealthy, antiquated, overcrowded. Surgery must be applied at the city's centre and we must use the knife. So Le Corbusier set to work planning a radical overhaul of Paris itself. A plan so radical that it would transform the city completely. So this is the plan for Le Corbusier's new Paris. And it was a new Paris because he basically hoped to tear down much of the city centre. A whole swathe of the right bank, which included parts of the Champs-Élysées, were all going to be torn down. And he was going to replace it with this. A network of 200 metre high skyscrapers with a huge superhighway connecting them all. Le Corbusier's plan is startlingly modern, perhaps more modern than anything that came out of Paris in the 1920s. Its sleek lines and high-tech forms seem to belong to the 21st century and beyond. Only the cars betray its real age. But his plan had a purpose. Now this was partly an attempt to save Paris, but it was also an attempt to make the city cleaner, healthier and more efficient. A city that was much more in tune with the 20th century itself. But all I can say is, Thank God, no one let him do it. Le Corbusier may not have managed to change Paris, but his dreams for modern architecture and modern life have been a defining influence on the world we inhabit today. And those dreams were fueled by Paris's audacious and optimistic spirit.
1928 had been a truly exceptional place, where people forgot the past, dreamed of the future, and lived in the moment. This was a place where the surrealists let their imaginations conquer reality, where painters, composers, and dancers found freedom to express themselves in dazzling ways. And where Europe's most ambitious dreamers fantasized about better worlds. After a devastating war, Paris had conjured up what was surely the most exhilarating party of the century. But 1928 would turn out to be the last hurrah. In the following year. The Roaring Twenties would be ended by one momentous event. The Wall Street crash was reported in Le Figaro on Tuesday, the 29th of October, 1929. Now it didn't make the front page. It's actually this tiny little story on page three, and that's because to the French it must have seemed like a largely irrelevant piece of international news, but. For the thousands of Americans who lived here in Paris, it was catastrophic. American expatriates read the news with dismay. Their seemingly endless funds had all but vanished, and they queued up to leave the city. Almost overnight, Paris changed. The bars and cafes, once filled with carefree cosmopolitan customers, were now empty. But worse was to come. In the 1930s, the depression spread to Europe, and France endured a bitter and protracted recession. In 1939, another world war started, and one year later, Paris, the city of joy and liberty, fell to the Nazis. Paris's reign as the world capital of the arts was arguably over, but as it and the rest of Europe recovered from the Second World War, another city. A very different city would take its place. In the next episode, we explore that city, New York in 1951. Exploring the land of the panda here on BBC Four next this evening. Wild China continues in just a moment. Thank、you